We're trying to finish up a little early today because we know that many of you are planning on attending what Lyle calls men's study group on violence this <laughs> afternoon. The healing of Simon Peter's mother-in-law is the first resurrection story with a small r in the gospel. If you go to Capernaum near the Sea of Galilee, you can attend a church there that looks a lot like a Jetson's spacecraft on legs that sits right down over the site of Peter's house. Now, this is from the inside of the sanctuary, and if, if this isn't his house, it's one just like it within a few meters of it. And those of you who went on the Israel trip, however many years ago that was, might remember gathering by this geodesic glass dome, uh, so you felt very much at home there, uh, and seeing this church right above it. And imagine going to church on a Sunday and hearing a text such as the one we heard today while looking down into this house that was purportedly the headquarters for uh, Jesus while he was in Capernaum, plus a geodesic dome. It's a troubling text. And what is here for us today? In the first paragraph, they enter Andrew and Simon Peter's house, where Simon's mother-in-law is still very, very ill. And the text says that, Jesus was told about this, and he came and he took her by the hand and he raised her up. He lifted her up. And then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. At the first hearing of the passage, I don't know if you heard what, you know, maybe a lot of us hear. The first time we hear it, it sounds like at least five guys have tromped into this little house where she's been laid up deathly ill with a fever. And as soon as, yeah, you, you hear that? And as soon as she's heard, Simon might have said, so, feeling better? Good. Could you make us all some sandwiches? And could, could, you, could you cut the edges off the way I like it? And no, no pickles. I hate pickles, thanks. We'll be in another room. Oh, oh, uh, could we take this candle? It's a little dark in there. You, you know your way around. But the verb to serve means something different in Mark's gospel. It means to go out and do ministry. The word deacon means servant. The verb diaconine is used for the angels in the wilderness who look for opportunities to serve and by the women who followed Jesus and served him. She was the first one healed who got up and served. And when I first read about the mother-in-law being healed only to get up and serve, I, I'm I'm, you can't blame me for going the way some of you went with this here because I'm naturally looking for instances of the disempowerment of women because there are so many places in the Bible where we can find them, mostly, though, in how they have been made invisible, how women have been made invisible in the Bible. And that's not because of the Bible, but it's because of the culture of the times in which it was written. Women's invisibility in sacred texts contributes to their invisibility in leadership roles, in higher paying jobs, in shaping public policy, or at least in a sense of diminishment where messages are sent over and over again, not to forget that this is a man's world. And the saddest thing is to meet women who believe these messages. Amen. <laughs> Say it again. Amen. We got to do a better job. And men, we're a little privileged, I think, and I don't believe we really know or feel what this is like. We have to do a better job. Simon's mother-in-law was raised up by Jesus. That's wonderful. Tell me her name. You, do you need to get the bulletin out again? Tell me her name. 
And do you notice who is even more invisible than her? Where is her daughter? Where is her daughter? Simon Peter must have had a wife if good old what's-her-name is his mother-in-law. What is her name? We don't know. Why don't we know? Simon Peter is one of the most famous figures in Christianity. St. Peter's in Rome is named for him. She is never once mentioned. This is one of the greatest examples of how a woman has been rendered invisible in the Bible. So we learn that Jesus is one of at least seven siblings. The Gospel of Mark chapter 6, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13 state that James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon were the brothers of Jesus, the son of Mary. The same verses also mentions and also sisters. So we know there's at least two, right? What were their names? We don't know how many sisters. We don't know what their names were. Wouldn't you think that if your brother was Jesus Christ, you'd get your name in the Bible? <laughs> oh, you've met my brother, Jesus Christ, and you would be... Ooh. Nicola Slee, in her PhD thesis, The Invisible Woman in Christianity, has this to say. Untold, unrecorded, and unsung. Yet for all the creative contributions which women have made to Christian tradition throughout the centuries, their stories have often gone untold, their names unrecorded, their exploits unsung, where women's stories and experience have not been altogether expurgated from the tradition frequently they have been marginalized, trivialized, or distorted, these images of women which have been preserved are all too often ambiguous, if not positively hostile. Women have been immortalized as the sinners, the servers, and the sufferers. And until very recently, women have been denied access to many traditional religious practices and offices and positions of leadership as well as opportunities for theological study. And even now, the situation is changing only very slowly. We got to make a change, don't we? Can I hear an amen? amen? Women's inferiority and invisibility has been ratified and reinforced by traditional male-dominated religious language and imagery and symbolism and theology. So, we got the longest name going. I'm Irvine United Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, an open and affirming just peace, global mission, creation, justice church. So I hesitate to add something else <laughs> to this moniker. But when is the time right to bring another kind of justice to our banner, and that of gender equality, and be really real and intentional about it? The story says, that Jesus raised her up. It's a form of resurrection with a small r that he performed for Simon's relative that day. Cynthia Briggs Kittredge says, Mark's gospel invites us to look for experiences of resurrection in everyday life, in the lives of families and the social and the political order. And the text says, Two or three times that Jesus intended to go and preach the message. And so what is that message? Is the message that Jesus is preaching that love is better than hate or violence? Is it that all of us deserve equal treatment, including equal pay for the same work? Is it that all of us deserve to walk freely through society without fear of abuse or violence? Is it that we never want to feel that we must be invisible in order to make someone else feel privileged? Or is it all of these things together? Can these things be a part of the Christian message? I think they can. I think they should be. Or I think we should give up on the whole enterprise altogether. And I'm not going to do that. Author Adam Erickson writes, what's, what's Jesus' point throughout his ministry is that he came to serve, not to be served. 
He said that if you want to be his disciples, that you should serve too, that you should serve the people who need to be served. According to Mark, his male disciples struggled to understand Jesus' message. In fact, they often fought over which of them was the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus repeatedly told them that they missed the point entirely, that whoever was the first had to be the last. And he called his disciples to a life of service. And the first person to understand what discipleship truly meant wasn't a male disciple. It was a female disciple. It was Simon's mother-in-law, good old what's-her-name. <laughs> this is an open table, whoever you are and wherever you are in your journey, you are welcome here.